on this episode of China Unscripted. The U.S. is in another cold war with China. How China's influence in corporate America makes us weaker, and why the U.S. government might let Taiwan fall. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesha. Joining us today is retired Air Force General Robert Spaulding. He's the CEO of Simper, a digital infrastructure company. He was the Senior Director for Strategic Planning on the National Security Council and advised the Trump administration on China. Thanks for being back on the podcast. It's great to be back. So we are in a second Cold War with China. How does America win? Well, we win uh, exactly the same way we did uh, the first Cold War. And it's really, um, it's an ideological war. It's an economic war. It's not as much a military war, although you'll see wars happening happening on the outskirts of it. That's what uh, uh, I believe the Russia-Ukraine um, conflict is. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, aspect of the second Cold War. Uh, so just like we had the Korean War, the, the Vietnam War, um, and a lot of uh, things going on in Europe during the first Cold War, you're going to see things happen maybe um, in Europe, but likely um, a lot happening in Asia. But, you know, the idea here that um, there's direct conflict, military conflict between the U.S. and China or the U.S. and Russia, you know, that's the part that I think uh, I'm very hopeful that we'll be mindful of um, because of the danger of nuclear escalation and the, and the catastrophe catastrophe that could cause. I think we were, you know, during the first Cold War, I think one of the benefits that we had was um, we were still, uh, you know, Nagasaki and Hiroshima were still pretty fresh in people's minds. And there was a just a recognition of the terrible destructiveness of nuclear weapons. And I think part of the problem of, uh, you know, after the end of the Cold War and starting this new Cold War is we've lost a little bit of that fear. And the fear is, I think, one of the things that kept us um, very focused on making sure that you know, there was no direct confrontation of the conflict. Um, although there was, you know, a few times that maybe we could have slipped in the conflict, I think cooler heads prevailed. What you don't see today, though, is just a recognition of how, um, how you know, you don't have kids hiding under their desks or you don't have people that are terrified of nuclear weapons. And they think that's a good thing. I don't think it is. I think it's actually a dangerous thing because it makes us think that, you know, the way we compete with China is not ideological, not economic, but rather militarily. And I absolutely disagree with that. Well, it's interesting because China never had that fear of nuclear weapons. I mean, Mao bragged that, oh, even if a nuclear bomb was dropped and I forget the numbers he used, but like there'd still be like millions of Chinese people left. We're fine. And so I wonder how Xi Jinping thinks about something like nuclear weapons with even more distance between him and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, Mao was a unique person, but I don't think unique in the sense that the party um, has changed much in that. I really think they look at the Chinese people as um, a tool to use in, you know, in what they want to do and, and not necessarily that, um, uh, you know, I don't consider that, for example, when we think of Taiwan, you know, I could see the Chinese Communist Party raising, um, raising the entire island uh, and not leaving anybody um, uh, surviving if that's what they thought it would take to take the island. And I don't think that they would hesitate a minute to lose millions of Chinese people if they thought it would, you know, get them closer to whatever their goals are. And so, um, yeah, I, I think definitely when you think about um, American leaders or any leaders of a free society where the citizens, you know, still have somewhat of a choice, uh, I don't think you're going to get the same outcomes from the Chinese Communist Party leadership as you would from leaders of of those types of nations. And, and that's the thing, you know, that can be very concerning because what, what we tend to do um, in national security and foreign policy is mirror image the way we look at the world. And we try to gauge a rational actor on the basis of the way we would make decisions. And I think that's a big problem. It's one of the problem, one of the reasons that we just missed the fact that Putin was going to invade Ukraine because they're like, you know, and I talked to so many people about this. And I'm like, it would be crazy. Why would they do that? It, you'd be destructive to their economy. Um, 
and it's because they don't have a, a same way the same way of looking at the world as we do and 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 I think you know Xi Jinping is exactly um that way in terms of you know our ability to gauge the decisions he's going to make unless you kind of begin to walk in his shoes and see the world through his eyes you know we're likely to stumble into something just because you know we try to um think about the decisions that he would make or the party would make you know using the way we look at the world as a point of reference. And it's really not that far-fetched. We saw with zero COVID, the Communist Party was fine locking people up in their apartments, and they didn't care if people starved to death in their apartments. That kind of you know mass government action is, is perfectly acceptable to the Chinese Communist Party and would be unthinkable in the West. Right. And, and the, way that they, um, the way that they pursue these types of issues um, are not uh, the same way that you might see somebody that has true empathy. In other words, you know, you're worrying about the suffering of the people. When they worry about things um, where people are suffering, it usually has to do with the reaction from the population based on that suffering and what the likelihood is that that reaction get, goes out of control. So they don't really care about the people themselves or the harm that that they cause. It is, will this result in a backlash from society that ends up having the party overthrown? So, you know, everything they do is, is, is for a purpose. And, and certainly they have no empathy for the people. I think that's the piece that I think uh, it would do well for uh, leaders of the free world to understand. The way you describe the communist party leadership basically is like sociopaths. Well, I mean, you know, it, it is, um, in a sense, um, you know, I, we, we hear this term, term all the time that people like to use it. They're like a mafia. And I believe that that to be true. It, it is very much a um, I mean, look, it's a political party that um, has one goal in mind, and that's to uh, stay in power. And there is no other calculus that um, surpasses that. And so. Um, the, everything they do is to stay in power and um, and they're willing to sacrifice any anybody or anything uh, to do that. And so um, and that's just not something that you see in the West or you haven't seen in the West. Uh, you're starting to see uh, you know, aspects of that kind of behavior, um, particularly we saw it a lot during covid. But, um, yeah, I mean, they're they they have a very and when. More importantly, I think when you start to think in the terms that they do, then you're much more able to predict the the actions that they might take. Well, so I think this is you mentioned the the sort of how we approach national uh, foreign policy with this mirror imaging, and I think this has really set the U.S. back a lot with dealing with the Second Cold War because I think a lot of people in the United States, and particularly in some branches of the government don't even see the fact that we're in another Cold War with China because there's this idea that, you know, after the first Cold War ended, uh, that was the end of history. Why would we ever want to do that again? It's not rational. We have this uh, worldview of globalism now where we can all just trade and we won't have to do this ever again. And that's kind of left the country. We don't have a whole of society approach to dealing with communist China. Well, and, and that's that's by design, you know, um, globalization, the Internet gave them reach into our societies and they use that to insinuate themselves everywhere. And I think that's the like just the other day there was, um, you know, I, w I was looking at this article talking about how, um, you know, uh, judges um, and it was a, I think a MI MIT economist was um, it was um, testifying to Congress about how judges are you know, favoring the arguments of corporations when they say, hey, this merger that we're going to have is not going to, you know, uh, lead to monopolistic behavior. It's, you know, it's not going to you know, hurt consumers. It's not going to hurt competition. And um, and when you start to kind of look at the judiciary, judiciary, the legislative branch, executive executive branch and start to understand that you have um, the the back and forth of um, people working in these very large corporations and then they find themselves in government and maybe they find themselves in becoming a judge um, or, you know, find themselves working in the commerce or treasury department or, 
Um, you know, they also have enormous lobbying functions on, on Capitol Hill. Then you uh, begin to understand that these uh, same corporations are paying the think tanks and they're paying the lobbying firms and they're paying the communications firms in uh, Washington, D.C. And, and in New York as well. You start to begin to understand that, you know, the way they insinuated themselves is very much um, aligned with corporate power in the, in the, in the rise of corporate power uh, and the consolidation of corporate power in the United States. And so that's how you get into this, um, into this ability to influence our political system without having to really overtly do it. You know, you, you basically, they, they are essentially aligned uh, business interests with the same donors that, for example, donate to the think tanks in Washington, D.C., and so when you look at, you know, ha and having spent my career in government and you look at, OK, what is it that government thinks about China and why do they think it? Well, a lot of the expertise and advice comes from academia and think tanks um, in Washington, D.C. A lot of the experts, the China experts, uh, they're in these think tanks. Well, you know, when you start to understand that the corporate donors to these think tanks are aligned in, in with the Chinese Communist Party in terms of their business interests, then you start to realize you, you get to this area where it's very hard for you to get out of this narrative that is promoting this idea of highly, highly centralized power in government. And so what I'm saying is you're starting to see, and this is, this is you know, where I think the, the, we have to really begin to think about this second Cold War you're starting to see the type of political system arise in the West that in many cases and in many ways mirrors what the Chinese Communist Party. It's a very, um, it's a very centralized system. Uh, antitrust has almost, is almost non-existent now. Um, patent uh, protections, which were in, in, uh, in uh, the Constitution, have been watered down through legislation promoted by these large corporate interests. And, and the, the unhealthy part of that is that it has led to um, the suppression of speech. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a narrative, there is an acceptable narrative, and then there's all the other voices that are kind of countered that narrative. And so when you're, when you're an official in the Defense Department or the State Department, you know, you pretty much have an idea of the, what is the proper way to think about China. And it is not um, to think about them as, you know, um, ruthless killers. It's to look at them as, you know, rational actors in the same way. So, you know, Xi Jinping is a rational actor in the same way that Joe Biden's a rational actor. And that the, the, the insanity of that um, is not able to be discussed in forms, whether they're in government or outside government, because that's that's outside the character of the narratives that are allowed. You know, this is what I experienced myself when I when we were working on, you know, beginning to try to make uh, senior leaders in the Defense Department understand the competition with China. Um, you had to tread lightly and um, and you had to watch what you you said that that was during the Obama administration. So even now, you know, after all of these years, you're still seeing in Washington, D.C., these elements come out and say, you know, if you say the Chinese Communist Party is bad or evil, like say you say they're evil, they may say that you're a right wing fascist or, or something of that nature. You know, you're you're saying something just, you know, forbidden to be said. And so if you and, and you realize that the that idea that you're a right wing fascist because you think the Chinese Communist Party is evil really lend, lets you know that it's very hard for Washington, D.C. to begin to understand the 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 threat from the Chinese Communist Party because they're not allowed to really speak about it. Now, and if you go back 50 years uh, and a government official called the Soviet Union evil, how would that be perceived? Well, um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, but Reagan called the um, called the Soviet Union evil, and um, there was a lot of people that criticized him for it. Um, you, you remember um, Jimmy Carter uh, was trying to 
you know, create this whole new reset with the Soviet Union. And um, and Reagan came in and he was, he, you know, he 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 called the Soviet Union what it was, which was, you know, an evil empire and um, and and really, you know, uh, started to focus on the economic and, and in particular for Reagan, the ideological aspects of um, that of the Cold War and how. You know, the the ideology uh, was so important to the way the Soviet Union was run. And I think the Chinese Communist Party is no different. So there are elements that we can see um, in the first Cold War where, um, you know, the, the system started to waver a little bit on how we should talk about the Soviet Union. But it was Reagan that really kind of, um, you know, kind of snapped things back. I think. Um, if you go back to the very beginning, it was Kennan who wrote the long telegram. That was a clear, um, a clear, you know, uh, statement of what the Soviet Union was, what the leadership believed and how we should think about them. There has been no such thing with China, right? There was no uh, China long telegram. There's, you know, and if you, you know, Kennan was highly respected. You name the one highly respected, respected statesman or diplomat in the United States that writ, that's written some, something similar that is as close to reality of what the Chinese Communist Party as Kennan did for the Soviet Union. Instead, we have Kissinger, you know, highly respected. And Kissinger is aligned with the Chinese Communist Party in ways that, um, I mean, you can just look at the way that they treat him almost like a demigod when he when he goes over there and, and visits. And so um, we don't have, um, you know, somebody that is respected, respected across the aisle, respected in the national security establishment like Kennan was, that's willing to stand up and say, these guys are bad. This is what they care about. And, you know, when we had, you know, President Trump, who was willing to, like, begin to, you know, say we have a problem with China, in the end, he, you know, he he vacillated. He said, you know, Xi Jinping is is an OK guy and we get along good. You know, you I think I believe, you know, it is very important that we call them what they are and then we begin to treat them as if they are that or else we're we're going to continue to succumb to this, um, these half measures that in in China loves half measures because they can basically use that to continue to do anything they want, whether that be in trade or finance or ideology. They can, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. You know, if you say, you know, China is like, you know, America, you know, that people have choices um, in, in, in some respect. And they'll say, yeah, China's, you know, the, the, the party will say China is a democracy. You know, these are the things that I think we have a very, very hard time in the West. Really, um, you have to you have to call them what they are. And then and that person, whoever that is, you know, right now you can't find somebody that has credibility that is a China expert that is willing to go on record and say these guys are evil. Oh, well, so let me play devil's advocate for a moment. So if somebody would argue that, you know, if you're calling them evil, what, what that will only lead to all out war or conflict with with them like with, there's no way to work with somebody that you're calling evil is is how where do you that only leads to conflict well um that's what we did with the soviet union it didn't lead to conflict i think the thing that that will prevent conflict is a recognition on both sides that nuclear weapons are absolutely devastating to both sides um positions you know, on the West, it's more about the the, the, the empathy for loss of life. Uh, in terms of China, the party, you know, has to fear weapons causing about their downfall. Um, you know, in, in any kind of you know high stakes nuclear war. So I I don't think it has anything to do with the rhetoric, um, whether or not we uh, find ourselves slipping slipping into conflict. I think it has everything to do with the weapons themselves. Um, you know, I, again, they they are they are a calculus changer. If you look at you know World War One and World War Two, you know, tens you know hundred million people dead in World War Two, or, or somewhere around that number. Uh, nothing approaching that since. Why? Well, because of nuclear weapons. They really changed the nature of warfare in terms of 
what countries are willing to do. It's not a frivolous thing to go to war with a nation that has a nuclear weapon. There, the other thing that, by the way, that everybody says is, oh, we're so economically intertwined, so we could never go to war. You know, that um, was proven you know, in, incorrect in both World War I and World War II. I mean, we were highly uh, economically integrated, and that didn't stop the war from happening. And so, you know, I think what is, again, I believe, is going to prevent us from going into actual military conflict with China is just a sober rea sobering reality that it could lead to the end of mankind. And so from that perspective, oh, good, go ahead, Matt. Oh, no, I was just, you know, that was a deep sigh of, of terror. Yeah, I mean, especially considering that, you know, Mao said, like, he didn't care about the fallout of nuclear war. I don't right. I don't know if China has that concern about the uh, catastrophes of nuclear Armageddon. I mean, Matt, that, that side, that's we all should be having that side, because then I think, you know, we would all be a little bit more sober of what the potential for, um, you know, and, and the implications of, you know, a, a military war with China. And that should lead us happily into where we need to be, which is. How do we compete ideology and, uh, ideologically and economically in ways that promote our principles and values? And, and, and when you go there, when you go to that space, then you say, OK, I don't need to spend a trillion dollars a year in defense. You know, as long as I have a strong nu nuclear presence and I use that and I, I make in this, by the way, this is what we did during the first Cold War. We ensure that the other side knows that these are our red lines and we're willing to go to war over that. Um, and but we won't as long as you don't cross these red lines, then and it, we can accept that the competition then stays ideological and economic. And when it goes there, then we you know, the next step there is we have to cut them off from access to our society and not just direct access to our society, but indirect access through allies and partners. And so any ally or partner unwilling to do to similarly cut them off then creates vulnerabilities for our society in terms of ideology and culture uh, and, um, and the political system and our, our economy. And so I think that's where we can start to get to work and we can start to divert some of that trillion dollars we're spending on defense into building the strength of our industrial base, our, our infrastructure, and really you know, reinvesting in our society, sending kids to, you know, become scientists and engineers. You know, these are the things that um, I think we could do if we were not so focused on, you know, hey, you know, we're going to have a war with China and we have an opportunity to win that, which I think is crazy. Um, you know, nobody wins in a nuclear war. And uh, the idea that we'd have a conventional war that doesn't turn nuclear is there's no way to predict that. Now, what you're suggesting about, uh, you know, reducing our economic interdependence with China and the countries that um, work with China, you're essentially this is like what happened during the first Cold War, which is you had the first world and the second world in the traditional uh, sense of those terms, which is the first world were the sort of Western allies and the second world was the Soviet allies. And, you know, they didn't work together. They didn't trade together, but you had really the world very divided. Um, is that, is that what we want? It absolutely is. And, you know, when you think about, um, you know, the, the way that the China, the, the Chinese Communist Party has insinuated themselves in the, in the, in, that, in the world system, it is to foul up what are the benefits of living in a free society. Um, you know, and we've, we've uh, been part and parcel to that. And so ec the, one of the biggest ones that, that we have seen destroyed over the last 30 plus years is economic opportunity in the West as manufacturing has moved and how as uh, the, the, the locus of economic engine has shifted from the West to the East. And I think um, those that have benefited from that have been, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party and, and certainly many of the Chinese people. Um, that's great, but what's come with that is this idea that the reason that 
the Chinese people have fared so well is because of China's system, their social and economic and political system. And there's no recognition of the fact that the technology, talent and capital um, that ex extends, not just built it, but continues to extend it every single day, comes from the free world. Be and, and that comes because China is so uh, interconnected with that free world. And so, you know, today what Yellen and their counterparts are trying to do is craft this, you know, clever um, system, you know, internationally that allows these two things to be connected and yet, and yet, um, and yet allows the economies and societies of the West to thrive. And what what China has built is a system that sucks all of the, you know, the um, the life out of the West. And so there is no ability to thrive when you have, in, a, in essence, you know, almost like a tumor connected to you. And so when we when we keep these connections going and we think that we're going to um, prevent conflict. What we are is basically giving the Chinese Communist Party the tools they need to subvert the, the free world. And so as long as that continues to exist, the party will get stronger. Um, Western democracies will get weaker. Um, our, and, and as that happens, the luster of Western democracies goes away. You know, who do the people of Africa and Latin America look to? They look to um, the communist system. Why? Because it's providing for the Chinese people. And I think as long as that happens, this inspiration, right? What is the, what is the power of America, the power to inspire? What causes that inspiration? The lifting of the huddled masses, the economic opportunity that comes with being able to choose your own destiny. That has now been subverted. And so now economic opportunity comes by fealty to the Chinese Communist Party. So as long as this is the idea that is allowed to reign in the world, because we think that, you know, having China as an economic partner um, will prevent war. Well, then, you know, over time, it will strengthen this idea that authoritarian systems are much better than democracies at, at providing for that economic opportunity. And um, and the luster will come, you know, the, the luster is already gone. The, the shine will rub off completely of Western democracies. And you'll see uh, the rise of the authoritarian state as the system, uh, you know, just like after um, you remember the end of the Cold War, we had all of these former Soviet states flipping to be democracies, you know, almost literally overnight. What you're going to start to see is, you know, this continued um, move the other direction where authoritarian systems are far more um, are, are far more preferred. Why? Because the elites are, are, are benefiting from it. And um, and unfortunately, the, the, the people uh, that will get the you know kudos for that are going to be the Chinese Communist Party, because they're the ones that have have created this alternative vision of what it means to live in a modern society. So you're saying there's a chance I could become emperor of America someday. You absolutely could. I mean, that's the that's the crazy thing. And we're already starting to see elements of you can't you can't challenge the narrative. You can't challenge the government narrative. Oh, by the way, that is the same narrative as the corporate sector's narrative and the financial sector's narrative and the academic sector's narrative. You know, what does that sound like? What does that look like? I don't think YouTube is going to be happy with us posting this. But let's do it anyway. <laughs> well, so I think the, the fundamental problem is you have one side, China, the Chinese Communist Party, that considers itself at war with the West. And then you have the West thinking we're just doing business. That's a huge disconnect. Right. And, and, and of course, at war has certain connotations in the West that absolutely don't resonate in China. At war means that um, my ideology is better than yours, and therefore I'm going to use pol the, the political system, the global political system, and your own political system to ensure that my ideology is the one that, that reigns dominant. You know, when I think of war, you know, what I was taught, you know, is, you know, for the most part, we're at peace at all times uh, until something happens where the government needs to, you know, um, coerce 
uh, you know, another nation state to do something. And then, you know, we send the military to use military force to achieve a political outcome. That is that is the, the, the Western notion of war. In China, the notion of war is we're always at war. And we're always at war because the Chinese Communist Party is always a threat from the, the principles of Western liberal democracy. And as long as those are allowed to survive, then they become a threat uh, to the Chinese Communist Party because the, the, the potential always could be that somehow a spark uh, happens in China that would allow those, those, uh, those principles of Western liberal democracies to, to come into favor. And that, therefore, it could lead to the overthrow of the Chinese Communist Party. So you have to suppress that. And the global narrative, the global ideological narrative, has to support this idea that, you know, um, you know, non-interference in countries and, you know, the, you know, the, this idea that the sovereign, you know, the, 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 the people exist for the sovereign, not the other way around. So at the beginning of the podcast, I asked you what steps the U.S. can take to win this new Cold War. It sounds like the U.S. is not taking those steps. No, they're not. And, you know, um, the uh, what we saw in the Trump administration was we had a great strategy. Uh, the strategy and it was, for the most part, adopted by the Biden administration. But the implementation of that strategy is what suffers. So in the in, in the Trump administration, you had. Uh, at the White House, you had the National Security Council and that had the National Economic Council. Um, the National Security Council recognized the implications of our rela economic relationship with China and re re understood they were a threat. The National Economic Council said, no, we need to do business with China. Then you had on the at the cab at the cabinet level, you had the Department of Defense and the Department of State. Say, hey, this is a threat. And then you had the, the Department of Commerce and the Department of Treasury saying, no, we need to continue to do business with them. Um, there was a constant war and Mnuchin was basically uh, had the power to uh, push off the State Department and DOD and to continue uh, these relationships with China. And what's happened is you had the same battle. You can see the same battle has been happening in the Biden administration. They were far more tough on China in the very beginning. Um, Basically, six months ago, that battle was won by the, the Treasury and Commerce Departments. And now it's back full on. You know, we need to do business trying to we need to recognize that they're a threat. So let's try to craft this, you know, um, you know, very sophisticated way of, you know, not enabling their military uh, development. You know, we they, they shouldn't use chips and AI to develop their military. That's not our problem. You know, our problem is they're using those relationships with those companies to subvert our own social, cultural and political system. And that's the part that we need to get after. Yeah. About, about a year ago, the Biden administration finally announced its uh, official China policy. And I knew something was already up there because it was this weird it was kind of bipolar. It's like half of it was like, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide. It's a threat. It's all of these things. But we have to work with them. And that's such a weird conclusion to come to after everything else that was said. And now we've Could, seen how- Can you imagine the same thing being said about Hitler? Oh, yeah. you know, he's a genocidal maniac, but we got to work with him. What? Well, but I think, I think it's historically, it's, it's helpful to understand that even in the United States, there was some substantial amount of support for Hitler uh, in the 30s. Uh, there, were, there were people who-, who like the Nazi ideology and who had, you know, clubs and societies in the U S that were in favor of that. And, and, uh, U S businesses were, you know, doing business with, with Nazi Germany, IBM, of course, famously helped with the punch cards that, that helped the Nazis keep track of, uh, all the Jews they wanted to exterminate, but also you had Hollywood, uh, censoring movies, uh, so they could get into the German market, uh, up until the U S got into the war. So there was, I do see some parallels with that. Well, but also think about this. We had the opportunity for a war, and it's tragic to say, we had the opportunity for a war to sever those relationships, right? Because overnight, those relationships were, for the most part, severed. What, what, so one of the downfalls, I guess, of the nuclear age is that it's not going to it's not going to allow for a war between the U.S. and China because it would be too devastating. So that means that there's nothing that will really cause that economic and political and social uh, and cultural cut, and therefore we continue to have 
a slow erosion uh, of our um, of our way of life and our way of government. And I think that's the thing. That's the um, that's the insight that the two PLA uh, lieutenant colonels, when they wrote Unrestricted Warfare, had had really uh, captured is this is that there is a different way to think about this competition with the West and this ideological competition. And that is if there is no chance for a real true military conflict between these two sides, well, then they have no real reason to disentangle, right? There's nothing that causes that automatic break like war. And there's really nothing like that for causing that automatic break. Now, look at what ha- what's happened with, um, with, with Putin and his invasion of Ukraine. I mean, for the most part, what you see is the West is paying for Ukraine and paying for Russia through its, you know, relationships with, you know, China. So um, we're basically funding both sides of the war and providing resources to both sides of the war because we are economically intertwined. And that's the outcome of that, uh, of that intertwinement. And so, you know, this is the concept that the Chinese Communist Party leadership understands that is that there's nothing going to cause that break. And so as long as we don't have that break, and by the way, this is why Xi Jinping says, well, we don't we shouldn't have cold, a Cold War mentality. You know, we did have that break. But, you know, in essence, I think what caused that was um, was somebody like Churchill coming to the United States and saying, you know, we have to fight this evil and and recognition, you know, uh, across the Atlantic that we must work together to fight this evil. Now you look at it, we're completely fractured um, as Western democracies in terms of our approach to China. Uh, you have Macron going over there and singing Xi Jinping's straight, uh, praises. So we are the Chinese Communist Party have found themselves in a peculiar, peculiar pace place in history where the nuclear weapons are, are, are going to ensure that no war happens that would cause a clean cut. And then there's no um, statesman of any stature that's willing to stand up and say, we have to do this. Now, you, you believe that, that, uh, th- that kind of direct war between the United States and China is perhaps unlikely. But what happens when the PLA finally starts their invasion of Taiwan? Well, I, you know, my uh, my belief is that the things that we could possibly, when I talk, when I say we, the military, um, uh, the things that the military could be possibly asked to do have to do with uh, evacuation or resupply, you know, just um, the the protection of uh, American citizens, uh, and to the extent those um, those Taiwanese that want to leave you know, our ability to, you know, what we should be thinking about is how do we, how do we um, create safe space or safe corridors so that we can, and and then how do we create the, the air bridge and the sea bridge that will help uh, for, with that evacuation? I think these are the ways that um, uh, the Taiwan war will unfold from, you know, in terms of how U.S. military might be involved. I think nuclear weapons will be involved in it, that they will be used as a way to, um, you know, to basically deter the Chinese from escalating in ways that could really re- result in a direct military conflict. And I think, you know, when you start to think about, you know, that um, that scenario of a Taiwan war, I do think that, you know, the a, a clear statement by the president of the United States saying we will use nuclear weapons if you don't allow us to evacuate our, our citizens and those that we want to uh, we want to protect. Um, I think will be the thing that allows us to create these corridors and then um, and then evacuate those people. But in terms of a direct military conflict where we're going to send um, an aircraft carrier into harm's way, um, first of all, it won't survive because of the, the weapons that the, the Chinese Communist Party have built on their side of the strait. But uh, second of all, we're just not going to risk those those lives you know, on a um, on something that we're just not going to be able to have. Um, you know, that much effect. Well, that's thousands of miles away from our shores, uh, thousands of miles away from the resources that we would need. Plus, we're se- severely depleted on all kinds of munitions and everything else. Um, and it's 70 miles from their shore. And they've got, they are brimming with weapons. Uh, it's just, it's a completely different, um, you know, it's a problem that is un 
solvable in terms of you're not going to see America race into, uh, you know, save Taiwan like we wasted, raced into, you know, uh, save Kuwait, for example, from Iraq. So it sounds like what you're advocating for is if the PLA invades Taiwan, it's not to actually respond with military force, but rather to just simply let the PLA take Taiwan, but try to evacuate Americans and any Taiwanese who want to leave. Yeah, I mean, because what what you do if you start to get in there, you, you raise the real uh, risk of nuclear war with China. But if if the United States is not willing to use military force, including potentially nuclear weapons, then doesn't that just give the Chinese Communist Party carte blanche to invade, knowing that the U.S. isn't going to resist? The U.S. is merely going to evacuate some people and let them take the island. So, so like, why not invade? Why not do it now? Well, I think they're, they've already made the decision to invade. You know, I, the... The, this is no difference in the decisions that were made. Um, they were uh, unpalatable decisions, but they were decisions made nevertheless in the first Cold War. Why weren't you know pilots allowed to you know go after SAM sites in northern Vietnam? Why weren't they allowed to you know blow up the the fighter jets on the ground? Because you know the leadership of the U.S. believed that. It created the risk of nuclear war with with the Soviet Union and potentially China. And so and, and you know, the if the same for the Korean War, you know, we push the we push the uh, Chinese all the way to the Yalu River and um, and then they pushed back. And, you know, MacArthur wanted to use nuclear weapons and and, and Truman said, no, we're not going to do that. And so and then you had, you know, of course, the use of force in um in uh, in Europe by the Soviet Union again all, every instance we had to directly um, meet the 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 Soviet Union in battle we avoided like the plague and the reason we avoided it is because of the risk of nuclear war so do you, to think that we're not going to do the exact same thing over Taiwan it has nothing to do with you know morality in the sense that you know we don't want to help the Taiwanese it has to do more with the morality or what are the implications of a global thermonuclear war? Right. But the, the implications for the United States of, of a thermonuclear war are different than the implications for the Chinese Communist Party, right? So if if our public view in this country is, oh, well, we, we are unwilling to uh, – use nuclear weapons because we understand what the, the problem is, then the Communist Party can say, <laughs> well, you know, internally, they, they laugh at us, right? Because they are willing to use it and they don't care. So um, that it kind of gives them like, you know, so what if they, what if they want to take over, uh, you know, Taiwan? Okay, the U.S. has a weak response and, and just evacuate some people. And then the Communist Party decides, oh, well, we're going to take uh, – we're going to take some of these Japanese islands like Okinawa. Now we're going to take uh, Vietnam. We're going to take, uh, you know, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, Malaysia. Like what, what if they just start working their way through the world? Yes, right. And so the, the U.S. Is, is still not willing to put troops on the ground and do was, anything? Right. This was a domino theory, you know, during the first Cold War, the belief that, you know, um, if the United States didn't insinuate themselves in Vietnam and Korea and other and elsewhere – that you'd have, uh, you know, the, the fall of all of these nations. Um, ultimately, you know, what uh, I think kept the United States and Soviet Union from going into direct nuclear conflict is some very um, direct, um, you know, red lines that were communicated to the Soviet Union. Now, uh, is does Taiwan fall within that red line? Um, you know, I think that uh, that's something that you know, probably from what I've seen, it's not going to not going to the rise to that level. You know, we don't expect that Taiwan is going to lead to the downfall of, of Western civilization if, if that's lost. But, you know, there does come a place in time and point in uh, in things where you have to say, you know, this is this is as far as we're willing to let you go. And we're willing to commit all of our nuclear forces to prevent you from doing that. That's something that has to be considered, you know, and I think Taiwan, it's a legitimate question. Um, I don't think that Taiwan has the same weight, though, of 
you know, Western Europe did during the first Cold War. I don't, I just don't think it now does Japan, who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe that's where uh, the line gets drawn. Japan's an ally of the United States. Taiwan is not. And then, then you have to look at, you know, how, what are, what are the, um, what are the interests involved and what are, what do you think that the Chinese communist party is willing to suffer? And what do you think the West uh, is willing to suffer? Is the Chinese Communist Party willing to trade nuclear shots over, um, over, uh, you know, re, um, uh, reincorporating Taiwan into into the mainland? Probably. Are we willing to, you know, take nuclear shots into L.A. or you know, or New York or Washington D.C. over the same thing? Probably not the same. Now, if it was Alaska or Texas. You know, maybe you know, obviously you'd have there'd be a different thing, or maybe it's you know Western Europe again, a different thing. So, um, so I'm not saying that um, that Taiwan's not worth saving. I'm just saying when you start to look at the fact that Taiwan's not an ally, that the level of interest between what we would be willing to trade for Taiwan and what the Chinese Communist Party might be willing to trade has to you have to basically make some determinations there. Now. You know, there are alternatives and the alternatives are that we that we create safe space so that the people that want to leave and and be protected, because ultimately the Chinese Communist Party doesn't care one whit about people. They care about the ground. They care about Taiwan, the ground. And it's the idea of Taiwan. It's not actually the Taiwanese people themselves. We care about the people just because, you know, we we have uh, empathy for human life. That's something that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't have. So what then are we willing to pay to uh, to, uh, you know, protect that life? And then what to what extent are we willing to go? I mean, the Berlin airlift is a good example of something where we prevented um, this direct nuclear conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States, but still were able to leave suffering until, you know, the we got the, the Soviet Union to back down. So these are the ways that we need to begin to think about the Taiwan problem, not so much that no matter what happens, we're going to war over Taiwan. Well, you're certainly right that the U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity is not the same as a red line on Taiwan. I have a somewhat different perspective on this, which is that uh, it's perhaps in the long term more important to draw the red line uh, before the Taiwan invasion. That is, that invading Taiwan is crossing that red line uh, simply because I, I, I know that, that you know, Japan is a U.S. ally. Taiwan is, is technically not. But it's only technically not. And that is, there, there isn't a moral difference between defending, defending Japan and defending Taiwan. Taiwan is a thriving democracy of 20 million people, uh, and defending them is very much in line with American values. I would argue more than defending, uh, even than defending Korea or South Korea, uh, where at the time it was a you know South Korean dictatorship as well. And so that the justification for that is like you, you have you have people living in a free country that have put an enormous effort to transform that country into a country that respects freedom and democracy. And then we decide that, well, it's not really worth defending that freedom and democracy because there's going to be danger and fallout from that. And uh, I think I think the red line is is before that happens. Uh, because the long-term implications of allowing a takeover of a free and democratic country is that if we can allow that in Taiwan, we can allow it in Japan, we can allow it in Europe, we can allow it in the United States. Yeah, I think you're right. The, 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 that declaration has to come before, right? Because, But the, the problem is, is that you've already got a declaration from the Chinese Communist Party that they will go to war. And so, um, and so that declaration may be, you know, the thing that ha- that takes us into war. So um, you're, you're not wrong about you have to say it beforehand if you want to prevent a war, because, you know, uh, trying to do it after the war started is not going to not going to work. But, you know, I think that you run the risk of that is the thing that leads to, to direct military conflict between the U.S. and China, because even they've been very clear. There is no ambiguity uh, on their side. And so um, by, by being clear um, with regard to our willingness to back up, um, you know, Taiwan with the full weight of our nuclear arsenal, 
um, that that's a that's a that's a something of a completely different sort. Now it could be that the Chinese Communist Party backs down. Um, now that is that is something that um, you know it, we need uh, you know somebody in a leadership position to make that decision and then be willing to back it up because if they're not, then there is no um, you can't kind of fake it. You 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 have to you have to do it with credibility. Obviously, you have to have the ability. We do have the ability to back up any statement that says we will we will utterly destroy you. Um, it is the calculation of what are you willing to risk for that, and why why um, why would we do that? And I think in that case, I mean, I don't want to um, you know say anything about the arguments that you make. I think they're compelling. Um, and, but somebody's going to have to make that decision. Uh, and that person, you know, needs to understand the implications of that. And that's really the thing that I don't think we've had a really good, um, discussion around that, those types of discussions, this real serious thought about the strategic implications of, you know, um, you know, going to war over this thing or that thing, those were real serious conversations we were having, uh, during the first Cold War. And that's the type of thing that we really need to have uh, during the second Cold War. I mean, hell, we don't even have people willing to recognize we're, that we're in a Cold War or that, you know, there is, you know, there, obviously there's just um, there's a lot of recognition that we could have this war over Taiwan. But I think just, you know, not talking about the things like we're talking here about how do you think about that strategically and what are we willing to do? Because if we are willing to go to war with China over Taiwan, then we are willing to go to nuclear war. And if we're willing to go to nuclear war, then you are absolutely right, Matt, in that we need to say so right now before the Chinese get the ideas to invade, because afterwards it's too late to put that genie back in the bottle. Right. Well, I don't, I don't think we need to uh, make the Communist Party decide not to invade. We just need to forestall it, which is to say that that our uh, the United States putting up a strong defense uh, could lead to the Chinese Communist Party deciding not that they're never going to invade, but just we're not going to invade now. OK, later. Well, we're not going to invade now. We still intend to, but we're not going to invade now. And you forestall it. And there is some advantage in that because I believe the Chinese Communist Party as a political entity is weak enough that if – an invasion can be pushed back long enough in enough years, as well as other actions taken, like economic uh, uh, actions that weaken the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they will not be a factor, perhaps, in 10 years. And then uh, we don't have to worry about that at all. Yeah, but Matt, I think that was the case um, maybe 10 years ago. It's not the case today. I don't think the Communist Party believes that they're a week. I think they believe that their time has come. I, I don't think there is no there's no way to forestall it. There is a um, I mean, you're, you're right in your intuition. There is a way to deter war. And that is but you are going to have to basically say that we're going to bring the entire weight of our nuclear arsenal to prevent that war. Um, and we're willing to use it. That's what forestalled, you know, the, the you know, the the invasion of the Soviets into Western Europe. You know, it wasn't um, it wasn't our combined conventional might in Western Europe because we knew the Russians had us beat there. Um, it was it was the fact that they that we had basically said it's mutually assured destruction if you do this. That's the kind of statement that you're going to have to make if you want to present prevent a war now in ta in Taiwan because the Chinese believe that they're strong enough and quite frankly the 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 facts back them up. Well, what about a situation like with Russia and Ukraine? The U.S. provides support for Taiwan that doesn't rise to that level. Um, well, I mean, there you're seeing right now. I mean, hell, you've got all kinds of support coming from China for Russia and Ukraine. That's what I was talking about before. We're basically funding both sides of the war because, you know, we're enabling China to help Russia and then we're sending arms to Ukraine. So um, we are. And that's the thing that you know, is absolutely flabbergasting. We weren't on both sides of the Korean War. We weren't on both sides of the Vietnam War because um, we weren't we weren't economically uh, and politically intertwined with the uh, Soviet Union. Um, today we are, and so therefore, you know, any proxy war that happens, you know, today the way we're economically inter interconnected 
you know, de-risking is a joke, th- then it's going to see the Western uh, resources, both uh, technology uh, and capital, getting into both sides of the conflict. So, I mean, it's like, you know, how are you going to put out a fire when both sides are pouring gas on it? Yeah. Well, do you think that the Taiwan invasion, you talk, we were talking earlier about something that causes a break that overnight cuts off that kind of economic axis of China. Do you think a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be the thing that would spark that kind of break? So, so I, I did, I used to, but I think, um, I think when, um, when, when, when Xi Jinping put Wang Huning in charge of, you know, um, of the, of, of bringing Taiwan back into the fold. I think, I think that was a the very, very good strategic move because I think the, what Wang Huning is going to make the, is, is going to try to make the case is, is that the Taiwan's not worth fighting for. It's an internal thing. And, um, and he's going to, he's going to use the same tools that he's used before to get us not to do anything about the Uyghurs, right? So, or, or about Hong Kong, it's about economic and financial. It's about climate change. It's about North Korea. It's about all the cooperation that China can give to the West. So why do you want to destroy that over Taiwan? I mean, come on, they've made the arguments before and, um, and I see them basically gearing up and that's why Wang Huning, I think is such a good choice uh, for being the guy that that says it, because hey, we're gonna we're gonna play this so that you know at the end of the day, you know all you know all of these you know very you know uh, elite billionaires in the West say let's turn our let's just let's look away for a little bit that, that'll be cleaned up and then we'll go be- get right back to business. I think that's what they're what they're setting up to do. So you know I was hopeful for a while that we that they would be. Um, a little bit more aggressive, and then that would enable this clean economic break. Now I'm starting to wonder, like, okay, the 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 smile campaign that's happened since the, the the 20th Party Congress and everything that's gone on since just tells me that you know Wang Hing, Wang Huning has a, a strategy to basically say, hey, you turn your head for uh, the Uyghurs, you turn your head for Hong Kong, uh, you turn your head for all these things. Why not just do it again? I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, you, you made some excellent points earlier about the rise and consolidation of corporate power in the U.S. and how that influences China policy. Um, but what what should we be doing then right now so we don't have to deal with the you know, Taiwan red line issue? Uh, what, what, what can we do to, uh, to, to fight? Because you talked about you know, China looks at, at the war as an ideological and economic war. So, so what, let's, let's say we shift the battle, the United States shifts the battlefield to, uh, economic and ideological. Uh, what can we do for that right now? Well, so, I mean, you, you, there's some, there's some really interesting things that have happened since, um, and it's not just about globalization. It's also about the internet and the consolidation of media. So now all media is corporate media, uh, we used to have local papers. We used to have, you know, the voices, you know, of a thousand different newspaper editors uh, that could, you know, uh, bring their own uh, uh, personal values into things. Um, you, all of that has gone away. And, to, to, and so that consolidation of corporate power has meant a consolidation of narrative power in the West um, with, the, you know, with the Internet and the, and the d- destruction of what I would say local um, uh, local media. Now you're starting to see some of that come back uh, with you know just kind of independent journalists just doing their thing on social media, but that can be drowned out pretty quickly, and then those people can be canceled. They could just be eliminated off the platform. So we this this is um, this has to be pretty sophisticated. You know, really has to do with you know, um, disentangling the, the large tech companies and the media companies um, from, you know, uh, you know, the average American voice. And so, you know, I one of the things that I thought when I was in the White House is this idea of open data in the West is a big problem because it's it's free to be collected and cataloged and and, and used by anybody to for the influence of, you know, people. And that's what primarily the tech companies did. They used it to make money, to make themselves very wealthy and to accumulate power, economic power. But um, the Chinese Communist Party just then leveraged that to go on social and political and cultural and all those other things and and basically create the narratives they want. And then we saw during COVID that the West started to embrace a lot of those ideas 
Um, so it goes beyond economics. It goes in the social, the political, and the cultural. Okay, um, I believe that data is is the thing that allows you, and really data about you, your data, uh, the the idea that it can be used and and used to understand you, understand your perceptions, perceptions, intentions, behaviors. I think is a big problem for democracies. I think the fact that you can um, you can basically have Kalia and Pfizer and all these things, this ability to look, basically hit a DVR rewind button on your life and say. Government have to be able to have this data to 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 see what you're doing and to and then furthermore to use um, AI to begin to manipulate the like ByteDance does um, with its algorithms. I think is that's the problem that um, that's one of the big problems from a technology standpoint we need to solve. And so to me, the w- the way you deal with that is you be- begin to imbue privacy and data security and data sovereignty into the our infrastructure in a way that protects the um you know the 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 ownership of that data about you uh, your data and so that's the thing that i think i've consent continued to think you know as we as we figure out how do we so getting uh, corporate america out of china and getting our financial system out of china is easy how do we start to disentangle this one corporate narrative and start to allow for many voices to rise um, you have to take away the ability for people to be silenced either by the government or large tech companies and you have to give them the power to have their own voice in um, by and having control over their own data so this is the thing that um, I think is very very important well this is interesting because I earlier you said what the US really needs is is like in the Cold War a strong statesmen to just come out and say the Chinese Communist Party is evil and Certainly a lot of people who have been in your position, you know, a military man, uh, advisor to the government, a lot of these people go into politics. But you chose a different route. You, you, you've, you're you, the CEO of Simper, you, you're this digital infrastructure company. And so it seems like you're focusing on something very different, this sort of uh, what you were just talking about, this, this, the need for... Why did you decide to choose digital infrastructure as your focus? Well, you know, two Christmases ago, um, AT&T Switching Center in Nashville got bombed, took down uh, telecommunications in Tennessee and surrounding states for several weeks. And so um, what I realized when I was in the White House was our infrastructure is extremely vulnerable to attack. So not only it's not just about, you know, our data, it's the ability to have continued communications to reach first responders or, you know, make a financial transaction like to go buy milk. How do you pay for it? Or, um, or your get health services. So these are all things that are absolutely critical. Um, I don't know if you know this, but you know, not too long ago, the, the federal government went out and hardened uh, all the AM stations in the countries for uh, against attack, like nuclear attack. Um, but then you, you look like who has an AM radio? Nobody does. Everybody has their smartphone, and you know what Semper, what we found at Semper is that those smartphones are resilient uh, to just about everything. Um, you can drop them in water, you throw them against a the wall, and you can even you know, have a high altitude electromagnetic pulse, which is basically a detonation of a nuclear weapon or a very powerful solar flare, which can take down our infrastructure. Your phone works just fine, but the, the, you have nothing to connect to. And so we believed, um, or I believe that you know, if you could create infrastructure that would make that connection happen and keep that connection going, then you would start to get some of these things, some of these problems like happen after Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, for, for example, where civil society breaks down quite rapidly because you don't have communication. You don't have the way to get services to people. People don't have a way to get uh, help and, and, and make financial transactions. And so that's, it starts there. It starts with the resiliency uh, that's needed in our infrastructure. And then as you build that out, you, you begin to build in the ability for the American people to take back control of their data because they have um, they have this infrastructure that not only is hardened, but it's also secure. And so understanding how to use encryption uh, that protects it, uh, your data from being used by tech companies or being used by, you know, in the case of the Chinese Communist Party, a state who wants to, to change your intentions, perceptions, or behaviors, I think is the, the thing that you know, we see as a long-term vision. Um, and at least I did from a technology standpoint. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen in the economic, the financial, and the political. But the social and cultural is really embedded today in the digital. And so part and parcel of that is control over your data so that you're 
social and political um, beliefs cannot be manipulated by those um, from outside the country or, you know, tech companies that have, you know, an ulterior motive. I mean, really, the again, this corporate media um, is not, you know, doesn't have American interests in, in mind. They have corporate interests in mind. You talk about, you're talking about a sort of um, hardware strengthening solution or hardware resiliency in terms of making sure that, uh, you know, your phone can be still connected to a network in the, in, you know, in case of a disaster or, or an EMP or, or nuclear detonation. Uh, but what about in terms of like, what, what's a, what are software solutions for dealing with the data privacy issue? Because that's not just a hardware thing, right? No, it, it very much is a software thing, but you have to get the hardware in first and then the software rides on top of that. And primarily it's an encryption thing. It's it's having data, your data be encrypted. Uh, I think we have tended to think of encryption as the purview of the federal government. And I believe encryption ought to be the purview of every American system, like your ability to encrypt your data uh, is, is a fundamental human right so that you can have the ability to live the kind of life that you want. Now, if the government thinks that you're uh, guilty of some crime, um, that doesn't mean they should all of a sudden have access to all your encrypted data. Have them go and place bugs just like they've always had to do. Have them go and actually do the investigative work. Don't allow them to press the easy button because they have full access to your data. I think that's where we went wrong in the Patriot Act. And I think that's where I would say we need as a as a democracy, as a republic, constitutional republic, draw the line between federal government access to your data and their need to prevent crime. If they need to prevent crime, then they can go get a warrant and then they can start planning bugs and they can start doing investigative stuff just like they used to. Hmm. Well, I think th what this all comes down to is, you know, Christopher Ray, the FBI director was talking about how China presents a whole of society approach. And for all of the things we've been talking about, there are a lot of barriers to American society as a whole as a society realizing the Chinese communist party is a threat. Right. Yeah, it is. And, and, and it's part and parcel to the to the global narrative. And I think that's the problem. And if we don't go after that um, with vigor and we don't recognize that the world has changed in fundamental ways that our founding fathers had no really concept of, you know, the Internet. Come on. How would they even understand that? If we don't understand these things and we don't reconcile them and we don't begin to um, you know, go about remediating them, it, we are we're on a downward slope to, to, to disaster. Fortunately, there's still a few uh, independent local newspaper editors or their equivalents, like, for example, Chris Chappell. Like Chris Chappell and Matt. Hey, I've already said I want to become emperor. So. <laughs> right, well, that, well, that's off then. Never mind. <laughs> we're doomed. So we're, I guess how do you. We're doomed. We're doomed. How do you then get a, any kind of red line in a society like this that's deeply enmeshed in business relationships with China, that there's no political will, especially after we've seen the, you know, how craven the, the Blinken and Yellen trip to China was. Uh, it's, it seems like, you know, they go, to, they go to Taiwan, they blow through that, they just keep pushing and there is no red line. So, I mean, look, it, it, is, it is doing things like you're doing on China Uncensored. It's really just trying to speak truth to power and allowing people to, you know, remove the blinders from their eyes and then in their own way begin to go about and make change. Um, we did not have a majority of Americans that supported the Revolutionary War. Um, we had a few people that were just fed up and committed to something different. And America has always ever been so. You're not going to see a majority go after this. But, you know, Everybody kind of seeing that sees the problem that begins to do go after the problem in their own way in their local communities or, or whether they run for office or whether they do something like you with China Uncensored is the way that we're going to get out of it. And then once you start to basically turn the tide, I believe that, you know, there, you know, we can begin to, to fix things. But, you know, um, so it, it, I am hopeful. It's not, I, I don't want to be known as Dr. Doom, but. 
um, we have to we have to be serious about it. We have to be serious minded, and we have to. You know, I, I loved what Robert uh, F. Robert Kennedy Jr. said yesterday. Um, you know, in his testimony, it's like we need to have freedom of speech and not just freedom for good speech, freedom from, from something that you don't want to hear because it, it may be the thing that saves you. And didn't they try to censor him at that censorship conference? Absolutely. That's the crazy thing. of you know, This is this is the new America. Well, so. I mean, the, the the audience watching this, these are people who are definitely interested and passionate and aware of the problem. What would your advice be to them? Because if you tell them to run for office, it's going to butt heads with me when I try to become emperor. <laughs> well, again, you know, I think like I, I decided to go after the technology side of things. I think, you know, there there's literally a million ways that you can make a difference. Um, it starts with understanding, you know, what reality is or having a better understanding what reality is versus uh, vis-a-vis the Chinese Communist Party and the own uh, the own failings of our uh, own system. And then you go out, you know, they're like Catherine Gale. I don't know if you know who she is, but she started this um, uh, Institute for Political Innovation and she really believes in final five voting and open primaries. And I think, you know, um, having people like that to, to go about things in their own way because they see a problem they want to fix the system i think is the only way that we're um that we're going to solve it and me dictating how that is i would rather give you the means to understand what the problem is and and this is what i've done so many times very successfully in 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 large organizations is it's really about awareness and everybody um, then, you know, in a free society can go out and attack the problem in their own way. And I think that's what's great about our, our system. It's, it is really um, everybody uh, has a I- different idea, a different way of going about it. And then they go about and they create, um, they create momentum around that idea. And I, I think, you know, that's, the, that's what's going to save us. Not, you know, me, um, you know, uh, being able to give a prescription for how this this very much because of our system because of who we are has to become from the grassroots and it has to you know to use a Chinese uh, Communist Party thing let you, we got to let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, if anyone wants to follow you uh, and learn more about uh, what you're doing, where should they go? So um, yeah, my Twitter is Robert underscore Spalding. There's no you in Spalding, and they can uh, you know follow our company at Semper S E M P R E dot A I. Great. It's been a well, pleasure might be not the right word. I'm very depressed. It's been very fascinating to have you on. Indeed. Go have a milkshake or a shot of whiskey or both. <laughs> I say, sounds good. Matt, let's install a a whiskey milkshake machine in the studio. All right, thanks again for joining us. Well, it's it's always great to have you on. We'll we'll get you on again soon, I'm sure. Plenty to talk about. Thanks so much. And once again, I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And we'll talk to you next time.